Well, today we are on woe number five in our series called Woe, as we are looking at the seven challenges towards godly Christian character that Jesus uh, gave us found in Matthew chapter 23. Uh, If you've been journeying with us through this series, you'll remember that each woe, it's it's really a warning, right? It's a warning of, of the pain and the sorrow that could be coming our way if we don't repent, right? That is, if we don't recognize our deficiencies of character, those deficiencies within us, and make the necessary changes in our lives, all right? As we know, uh, we, we don't like to be around people who are, you know, selfish, who have a deficient character, right? They usually aren't very kind people. They often take advantage of others. And so we often don't like being around those people. And the reality is, is if we're like that, people won't want to be around us either. And friends, Jesus wants what's best for us, which includes good relationships with each other. And so we need to work on our character. We need to work on who we are on the inside first as that flows to the outside and the words we say and the things we do. And God wants to change and transform us from the inside out. And so these words that, that Jesus uses that really are a warning, that are sometimes hard to hear, they're for us. Right? Jesus wants us to trust and follow him. He wants what's best for us, but we can only receive his best when we're actually obedient to him. When we actually listen to him, and, and take what he's said to us and begin to put it into practice. And so Jesus does want what's best for us. And godly Christian character is for our good. It is for the good of others. And it is for the good of actually sharing the good news of Jesus with other people. Because as we've said multiple times throughout this series, the religious leaders in the time of Jesus, they were those individuals that the rest of society looked to. To say, okay, th- this must be what God is like. This must be what God wants for us and from us. Well, today, that's us. If we call ourselves Christians. Right? People look to us to, to, to answer the question, well, well, who is God? What was Jesus like? What does God want for us? They look to us, to you and to me. Uh, it's why... Again, I, I mentioned it earlier on in this series uh, that, you know, there, there's that quote that is often attributed to Gandhi who said, I like your Christ, I do not like your Christians because your Christians are so unlike your Christ, right? We, we don't want that to be true of us. We want people to see Jesus when they look at us. And that starts inside. That starts with our character, Now, in this series, so far, we've looked at all kinds of aspects of character. We've looked at integrity and humility. We've looked at honesty and even having godly priorities, which, if we're honest, none of these have been easy, right? None of these warnings have been easy to hear because they've been incredibly challenging, challenging us to the very core of who we are. Jesus' words have been pretty heavy because these are serious issues. And friends, <laughs> he, he doesn't let up, even here in this fifth woe when he addressed the issue of greed. Now, if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 23. We're going to be looking at verses 25 to 26. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have the words up on the screen for you. Uh, this is, aside from the first two woes, this is probably one of the shorter woes. Um, however, you know me, I talk long, so bear with me. I will do my best to try and, you know, keep it, uh, keep it short and sweet. Matthew chapter 23, verses 25 and 26. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. And so after his typical calling out of the religious leaders, recognizing their hypocrisy and not being who they said they were as representatives of God, 
Jesus then used the illustration of, of serving a meal to address this deeper issue of greed. Right? He said, you clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Now here, Jesus is building on those purity laws that the religious leaders you know, were always obsessing over uh, and that we kind of brought in to play last week when we looked at the fourth woe on priorities when Jesus talked about the dietary laws of the Old Testament and how, you know, there were many unclean animals that the Israelites weren't supposed to eat, including gnats and camels, if you can remember to last week. However, this time, Jesus' focus is on cleanliness, the cleanliness of dishes used for serving food. In the Old Testament law, there was actually a number of rules and regulations about this. Uh, Sadly, they're not all like clumped together in one place. They're kind of scattered throughout. So I'm just going to give you a a couple of quick examples of how uh, dishes could often become unclean and how they were to be dealt with. Uh, In Leviticus chapter 6, verse 28, when the meat of a sin offering was cooked in a clay pot, or when it was cooked, it says... In the, uh, the clay pot the meat is cooked in must be broken, but if it is cooked in a bronze pot, that pot is to be scoured and rinsed with water. Right? So clay was a, a regular material that they used to make dishes and pots and things like that. And they're saying, hey, if it was a clay pot that this sacrifice, the meat was boiled in, that clay pot actually had to be destroyed. It would sometimes like absorb some of the bacteria and things like that. And it actually wasn't a healthy thing to reuse. And so for their safety, God said, destroy it, get rid of it. If it was a bronze pot, they were to scour it, right? Scrub it, rinse it out, make sure it was nice and clean. Uh, In the example when an animal that moves along the ground, such as a a weasel or rat or gecko or a lizard, if one of those unclean animals dies and falls uh, onto or into something, in Leviticus 11 it says when one of them dies and falls on something, That article, whatever its use, will be unclean, whether it is made of wood, cloth, hide, or sackcloth. Put it in water, it will be unclean till evening, and then it will be clean. If one of them falls into a clay pot, everything in it will be unclean, and you must break the pot. I mean, it's kind of like, well, yeah, if you've got a a pot of, you know, to store food and something dead falls into it, you should probably get rid of it, right? Kind of a, a, a duh kind of moment, but... For some of those articles and things that we maybe don't consume, like dishes and other things not made out of clay, then it was uh, soaking it in water, right? How many of you like to soak your dishes in a a, a sink full of water? And soap, okay. Yeah, okay. Some of you are are suckers for punishment. You just like to scrub, right? I like to to soak and let the water and the the dish soap do its work. But hey, do do it your way if that's how you want to do it. Um, In fact, even in the case of of, of a man or a woman who is sick, uh, if they were to touch something, then it would also become unclean. In Leviticus 15, for example, it says a clay pot that a man touches must be broken and any wooden article is to be rinsed with water. Right Throughout the Old Testament law, which is specifically found in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, throughout these laws, these these ritual cleansings and washings were described throughout. And so there were a lot of rules and regulations surrounding uh, the dishes used to serve and to store food. Now in the time of Jesus, the religious leaders took these rules and thought, you know what, there's just not enough of them. Let's make more. Right? It's like, Really? There's 613 laws in the Old Testament. That's not enough for you, but they they made more. And so they required all kinds of ritualistic washing and cleansing, not only of dishes, but of people as well. In fact, we see this as as like an aside that was written to the readers uh, at the beginning of Mark chapter 7, where it says, the Pharisees and all of the Jews do not eat unless they give their hands a ceremonial washing holding to the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash their hands and they observe many other traditions such as the washing of cups, 
pitchers and kettles. And so at that time, cleanliness was a big deal. I think most of us would probably say that's true for us today, uh, especially during the pandemic, but many of us have kind of kept those things going after, right? We, we kind of have become clean freaks. We disinfect everything all the time. It's kind of like, you know, somebody walk. how many of you, oh, what's his name? Tim Hawkins. How many of you have heard of the comedian Tim Hawkins? Hilarious. Look him up. He has one that's actually uh, dealing with, with churches and, and greeters, and it's pretty funny because, you know, as most churches do nowadays, they have those hand sanitizing stations. And so he, he, he talks about how, you know, a, a greeter, uh, you know, people coming in, it's like, oh, yeah, hand sanitizer. Oh, now nice to meet you. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you're, you're a little bit sick and coughing there. I'm just going to, you know, oh, hey, you got, you got children? It's like, you know, like just kind of almost full body washing, right? We've kind of gotten to that place. We've become a little bit neurotic about cleanliness, which is how the religious leaders were, right? Many of the religious leaders were fanatics of cleanliness, focusing on external cleanliness. But Jesus used this obsession to make a larger point by comparing the cleanliness of the outside with what is inside. Now, as everyone knows, right, it's important to clean both the inside and the outside of dishes, right? Uh, There's this picture here on the screen of a whole lot of dirty dishes. For some of you, you're, you know, you're itching to start cleaning those already. You're like, oh my goodness, we can't do that. We can't leave that, right? Dishes need to be cleaned. Of of course, the outside of dishes and, and cups and mugs and things like that they need to be cleaned, right? I mean, if you were to serve food to somebody and the outside of the dish was filthy, they're going to make assumptions about what's inside the dish. Not to mention, passing that around, people are then going to get their hands dirty, and we often eat with our hands, so, you know, that's, that's not a good thing. Of course, even more so, the inside of the dish needs to be cleaned. Right? That's what touches the food. And if the dish is dirty, then the food could be contaminated. Uh, It could seriously affect the taste, the quality, and even the healthiness of the food. None of us want to get food poisoning. That's, That's not something we look forward to. However, within this passage, Jesus clearly isn't talking about dishes, is he? Right? There's clearly more going on here than just the cleanliness of dishes because Jesus said that these dishes were full of greed and self-indulgence. That the insides of the dishes were tarnished with greed and self-indulgence, which is going to take more than just a ritual washing to clean up. And so Jesus was comparing the cleanliness of the inside and the outside of dishes as a representative of the inside and the outside of those religious leaders. You see, the religious leaders cared more about the outside, that is, their appearance, than they did about who they were on the inside. They were concerned more about how others saw them, the things that people could notice, and and those things that would impress others, rather than focusing on Uh, what was going on inside them, in their hearts, which is their character. Remember, our character is who we are on the inside. Right? It's who we are when nobody's watching. If we're honest, that's who we truly are. And yet the religious leaders cared more about how people saw them than who they actually were and who they were becoming. But even though they might have looked good on the outside, they were full of greed and self-indulgence. Now, the Greek word for for greed used here in this verse is not actually the word greed, even though it does imply it. It's actually the word plunder. It's the word plunder. Those those things that are, are stolen or taken by force. Now, the religious leaders would never actually take something by physical force. That would make them look bad on the outside. 
But they were more than happy to scheme and connive and manipulate in order to get what they wanted. They would use their authority and their influence to manipulate people into actually coercing them into giving them what they asked for. For example, in Mark chapter 12, Jesus was accusing the religious leaders once again of all kinds of terrible things that they were doing. And one of the things that he accused the religious leaders of doing was taking advantage of some of the most helpless people in society, widows. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus said, watch out for the teachers of the law. They devour widows' houses. These men will be punished most severely. And so the religious leaders were, were devouring. They were, they were taking away the houses of these widows. I mean, that's, that's horrible. That's absolutely horrible. They were taking these widows who were, in a sense, some of the most helpless people in society and making them homeless. And how did they do that? With their traditions. By changing and adding in all of these extra rules. Uh, One example and one way that they did this is found back in Mark chapter 7 where the religious leaders had been accusing Jesus' disciples of eating with unwashed hands. And Jesus turned it around on them and said that they were ignoring and disobeying God's commands in order to keep their traditions. He said, you have a fine way of setting aside the commands of God in order to observe your own traditions. For Moses said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is Corbin, that is devoted to God, then you no longer let them do anything for their father or mother. Now this word Corbin is foreign to us, but this was referring to one of those traditions, one of those extra rules and regulations that the religious leaders were adding into the legal code. And basically what it was, was they were telling people, hey, if you want to have a better standing with God, if you want God to love and accept you more, then you need to do all of these things, one of them being you need to give more. Now friends, that that is not true. God loves us incredibly. And, And nothing that we say, think, or do can change the amount of love that he has for us. He loved us so much he gave us Jesus to die on the cross for us. I mean, that, it's huge, okay? So, so what we do cannot change God's love for us. But they told these things, they taught these things, telling people, hey, you need to, if you want a higher standing with God, you need to devote your time, your, or your, your money, your possessions, even your property, such as a house that you own, to the temple, to God. Of course, that was giving it to them because they were the ones who were the leaders in the temple. And so they had people confused and thinking, oh, if I want God to accept me, I need to give more and more and more stuff. And so people were literally signing over the deeds of homes, which... At that time, it was usually the oldest male in the family who owned the property. And so these oldest sons were actually saying, I mean, if that's what God wants me to do, okay, fine. Like, here, take my home, even though my mom is living in that home. Take it, because if that's what God wants me to do, I'm willing to make that sacrifice. It was a complete and utter betrayal of the actual commands of God to honor our parents. And so there was many different ways that the religious leaders were manipulating people in order to rob them, in order to steal from them. Now, friends, I, I know it's very easy in our minds to think of people who are in authority then, to be critical of people in leadership. Yeah, sometimes those positions of authority and and power give people the ability to take advantage of others. But we all do it, right? We all 
try and take advantage of the situation for our own good. We all wrestle with wanting more. Right? The greed that Jesus had accused the religious leaders of, of harboring within themselves isn't just your typical greed of, I want that, <laughs> right? of wanting more. It was an insidious selfishness that got them to scheme and to take advantage of others in order to extort them and get what they wanted. It was selfishness at its very worst. And so even though the religious leaders might have looked good on the outside, inside they were a selfish, moldy mess. And that selfishness kept them from doing the very things that God wanted them to do. It kept them from loving God and loving others, which they knew was the basis for the entire Old Testament law. It kept them from the very things that they were supposed to be doing. That's why Jesus put the emphasis on the inside of a person, on their heart and their character, when he said, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. The the religious leaders were trying to clean themselves up from the outside in. But Jesus completely turns it around and says, no, it starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. And, And we can't just remove the mess. We need to replace it with something. So what's the opposite of greed? Generosity. Right? The opposite of greed and selfishness is generosity. Generosity is not just about giving money. Please hear me. Right? Generosity at the heart of it is about putting our focus on others first. It's being less concerned about yourself and more concerned about other people. Now that is often shown in our lives by giving ourselves, by right? giving our time, our energy, our money, our, our abilities, all that we are for the good of of others but it starts in the heart now it's important to notice that both greed and generosity are not just things that we do but they're actually a part of who we are right we talk about people being greedy being generous that's a state of being right Uh, we are either greedy or generous We can't be both. There's no middle ground here. We are either selfish or selfless. Uh, Even in those times that we might do something that looks generous, if the goal is to still make ourselves look good, make ourselves feel good, then the focus is still on ourselves. And like the religious leaders, then it's still selfish and greedy because it's all about me. This This is a hard one. Right? It really comes down to our focus. The outward actions can be exactly the same. And yet if the heart is, in not, is not in the right place, then it completely changes everything. It really comes down to our motivation and our character. Friends, we're going to have a hard time loving God and loving others if we're always thinking about ourselves. We really will have a hard time to love others, and to love God if we're just thinking about me. It's going to strain our relationships. It's going to make life tough because nobody will want to be around us if it's always just about us. And so we should want to be generous. Of course, one of the greatest reasons why we should want to be generous is because that's who God is. Listen to how God is described in Psalm chapter 36. King David, king over Israel, who as king, you would have thought, you know, he could be the most selfish guy. He has all the power and all the ability to get as much wealth and control as he wanted to. And yet he was incredibly generous as he also recognized the generosity of God. He wrote, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountains. Your justice like the great deep. 
In those verses, it doesn't mention the word generosity or giving or anything like that. And yet, it's all about generosity. Right? God's love that reaches to the heavens is so abundant that it is constantly pouring over and flowing into our lives. God's faithfulness that stretches to the skies causes him to always be faithful to us even when we're not faithful to him. His righteousness that causes him to always do the right thing is so huge, it's like the mighty mountains. And we can be sure that he will do right by us and for us. And God's justice is massive, like the depths of the oceans. And we can trust that he will carry out justice on our behalf. Friends, God is generous. And it's not just something that he does, it's, it's who he is. It's at the core of his being. Right? He gives us love and justice, forgiveness and grace. He's given us everything that we have. All of our possessions, our finances, our loved ones and relationships, the different abilities that we have, the passions, those things that interest us, Everything that we have, all of the good things in our lives are from him. God is generous. The question for us is, are we? Right? Are, are you generous? Now, most people, if you ask them, you know, we, we like to think that we're generous, don't we? We often play the comparison game. Well, I gave more than that person. I must be generous. But friends, we aren't really all that generous. In fact, I used to think I was generous. Uh, when I was in high school, I was schooling full-time, working part-time, but I used the money that I was making to sponsor a child in the third world, in a third world country. Uh, I gave up the opportunity of good-paying jobs to study and to go into full-time ministry in order to help people to know Jesus. Uh, in a season when our family was blessed to have two vehicles, uh, God put on our hearts to, to give uh, our car away to somebody who is in need. Uh, we've given countless hours to sitting with people who are hurting to show the love of Jesus to those who felt rejected. We've given all kinds of money and possessions and time and energy to all kinds of things. And friends, I'm not saying this to toot my own horn. I'm saying this because in all of those things, it was often about how are others going to see this? Right? What can I get out of this? Right? It, it, it often, if, if I'm honest with myself, there's often that part of me that goes, you know, I hope somebody notices. And sadly, that's true in all of our hearts, isn't it? Too often, it's about us. And friends, our generosity is nothing compared to what God has given to us. Our every, everyone has a line in, in their lives. Everyone has a line. Everyone has something that they're not willing to give, a, a place where they're not willing to go past and say, no, I, I'll give up to this point in my time, my energy, my money, whatever, but no further. Right? You, you push anyone, and, and at some point we're going to say enough, no more. But friends, Jesus gave us everything. He gave everything. He gave up the comfort of heaven to come into this world to help us. He gave, he gave us himself. He gave his time, his energy, his love, his grace, his forgiveness, everything. He gave his very life for you and for me. That's the kind of generosity that God has. And the challenge is that that's the kind of generosity that God wants us to have. How, though? How can we possibly be that radically generous? Well, friends, we can't do it on our own. 
Right? Jesus told us, first clean the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will also be clean. But do we really have the ability to completely change and transform ourselves on the inside? I know I can't. Not by myself. Right? This is not something, this process is not something that we can start on our own. We need Jesus to change and transform us at the core of who we are. But friends, it is possible because of Jesus' death and resurrection. All right, we're two weeks away from Easter, and I know, you know we like to celebrate Jesus' death and resu- his death on Good Friday, his resurrection on Easter Sunday. Friends, we need to be celebrating it and keep it forefront in our minds all the time, throughout the year. All right, Jesus' death paid the price for us to be forgiven. We owed an insurmountable debt for all of the wrong things we've ever done and ever will do, and yet Jesus paid it all for us. We don't owe anything. And his resurrection reveals the new life and the transforming power at work in our lives when we put our faith and our trust in him. We can't change ourselves but he can change us. As the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, that is, if anyone has put their faith and their trust in Jesus, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. When we put our faith and our trust in him, he begins to change us and transform us from the inside out. He removes that heart of stone that was completely resistant to him and he gives us a heart of flesh that is willing to listen and to be changed and transformed into who he wants us to be. However, this transformation in our lives is only the start of the process. I wish, (laughs) I wish that the moment we put our faith and our trust in him that just instantly everything was different that it wasn't a struggle, that it didn't take hard work, but it does. We still have to work at growing as followers of Jesus and at growing in our character. And that includes in this area of generosity, of giving of ourselves, of taking the focus off of me and putting it onto others. So friends, if you want to grow in your relationship with Jesus, if you want to grow in being like Jesus in generosity, then there are a few things that we can all do. First, we should ask Jesus to help us to become more generous. Again, we can't do it on our own. We can't do it in our own strength. It's not something that we can just flip a switch and all of a sudden we're more generous. We need his help. And so we need to trust him. I know many of us, it it can be tempting at times. We think, hey, I prayed a prayer however many years ago. I put my faith and my trust in Jesus back then. Now I'm able to move on. I'm able to move past that dependence. No, friends, we, we need to live lives of dependence on him. We need to continue to trust and follow him and ask for him help for his help in all and every way in our lives. Right? Jesus doesn't just save us and then leave us on our own. He's there for us all the time and we need to ask for his help in everything. So let's ask for his help to be generous. Second, like asking for patience, which uh, is a dangerous prayer. I'm just warning you. Right? If you pray for patience, he's going to put you in situations that are going to test your patience. Well, be ready for Jesus to put you in situations where he's going to stretch you in being generous. Again, we all have that line. That point where you know, we don't want to go past that. Where it's like, you know what, it's going to hurt to give more than that. And so what does Jesus do? Well, if he wants to grow you in generosity, if you want to grow to be more like Jesus in generosity, he's going to bring you right to that line and then he's going to nudge you. And he's going to nudge you. And he's going to nudge you. 
right? Because that's what it takes to grow us, to get us to go further than what we've ever done before. And friends, this is actually a, a, a challenge of faith. Uh, recently in my daily Bible reading, I've been reading in the Old Testament and I've been stuck in the book of Leviticus. So if you've ever been there, it's tough. It's, it's tough slogging. It's a lot of rules and regulations. Um, but, but one of the things I've noticed throughout Leviticus and, and then into Numbers is how oftentimes the Israelites, as God was leading them in and, and throughout the wilderness, how they would so often grumble and complain. And sometimes God's reactions were incredibly, well, harsh. I didn't get it. For many years, I didn't get it. It's like, God, why are you so upset? Why are you like striking some of them down when they're in the wilderness and they're complaining about not having enough water to drink? Like that's a basic need. But I came to realize that the reason why it was such an issue was because it showed their lack of trust in him. It showed their lack of trust. They weren't willing to say, God, we have this need. You know our need. But we trust that you're going to fulfill it. Instead, they're whining and grumbling and threatening to stone Moses and Aaron. And like, it was not pretty. But it showed their lack of faith and their lack of trust. Friends, if we truly want to grow in generosity, it's going to require us to grow in our faith and our trust that God is going to care for us. That he will continue to provide for our needs. That he will carry us through. So much so that we don't have to focus on ourselves. We can focus on him and on what he wants us to focus on. Because he'll take care of us. So first, we need to ask Jesus to help us to become more generous. Second, we need to be ready for Jesus to put us in those situations where he's going to stretch us in our giving. Third, keep in mind and remember all of the ways that God has been generous to you. It's hard to give when we think about the things that we've given when we look at our situations and we consider what we have and what we don't have. But when we think and stay focused on all that God has given to us, that's freeing. That reminds us of his goodness in our lives. And remember, we can never outgive God. He is so incredibly generous and he has promised to take care of us when we follow him so ask god to help you to grow in generosity be ready to be stretched in that generosity and as you're being stretched remember god's goodness in your life remember all of the good things that he's given to you and continue to trust and follow him would you pray with me father we thank you so much that you are generous. God, we thank you that you have given so many incredible things to us. Lord, not just our money and finances and possessions and things like that, which is, it's so easy for our minds to go there. But you've given us time another day on this earth. As we sang earlier, you've given us breath in our lungs. You've given us passions, abilities. You've given us relationships, our families and our friends. You've given us a church, a church family where we can love each other and worship together. God, you've given us so, so much. Because your focus is on us. God, would you change our hearts? Would you change us from the inside out? 
Would you give us a heart of generosity and not a heart of greed? Would you help us to be others-focused, not self-focused? Would you draw our hearts and our attentions continually back to you and back to who you've called us to be in loving others? Thank you for your goodness in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray.